This lesson will focus upon the neuromuscular junction. This is where a nerve talks to a muscle cell. We have to give you a couple other names for this same junction. Motor end plate. Whenever you see the term motor, when we're talking about neurology, that's basically you're going to move a muscle or make a gland work. Then the third term that means the same thing is the myoneural junction. Okay, so all these three terms that are on the screen mean the same thing. We're talking about this junction. Let me draw it for you. It's going to be a crude drawing, but that's okay. So here I'm drawing the end of an axon. We've seen this before. So down at the bottom here, this is the presynaptic membrane that would store the neurotransmitter, which we're going to talk about. Well, lo and, lo and behold, then, this junction requires a muscle cell, a myocyte. Okay, so let me do some labeling here. This is the axon. This is the myocyte. And we know that we can put the neurotransmitters that are released from the presynaptic membrane and they will diffuse to the postsynaptic post membrane. My tongue gets tied. And the name of that neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. This is your classical neuromuscular junction. Now I want to show you some great illustrations that make my neuromuscular junction look bad, but that's okay. So I want to just point out some things. Motor neuron, action potentials coming down and depolarizing this membrane. Once the depolarizations end, you could say the nerve impulse ends, that's the stimulus for these vesicles to release acetylcholine. Acetylcholine diffuses across to the postsynaptic membrane, which happens to be a muscle cell, and they bind to these receptors. And then you know that after that happens, then the neurotransmitter has to either be chewed up, and we'll talk about acetylcholinesterase here in a second, it has to be chewed up or pumped away, depending on what neurotransmitter you're talking about. Okay, so up here, let me just talk about this enzyme, acetylcholine esterase. Well, lo and behold, I'm going to blot out enzyme because you should know that any word that ends in ACE, A-S-E, means an enzyme. So acetylcholine esterase, your brain should say, oh, that's an enzyme. Okay, let's look at a couple professional drawings. Uh, here we go. This is a motor end plate. I'll point out a few things. The axon, which is then providing the motor neuron. In this case, a nerve impulse comes down. It only travels one direction. It cannot go back up, partly because the membrane right behind it is refractory. We're going to get release of acetylcholine into this cleft. And there's specific receptors, and then the enzyme acetylcholinesterase that chews up the acetylcholine, and it ends up being some of the acetylcholine goes back into the presynaptic membrane. And also, this diagram makes the point that an action potential is initiated on that muscle membrane, and it's going to lead to contraction. Another professional drawing. Again, acetylcholine is being released up here on the top. Acetylcholine is often abbreviated capital A, capital C, little h. And then we get skeletal muscle cell membrane contracting here. And then this other diagram shows a little higher magnification. And the, what I want to point out is acetylcholine chews up the Acetylcholine esterase, I should say, the enzyme, chews up the acetylcholine, and the choline is recycled back to the presynaptic cell. And again, we get initiation of the action potential and contraction of this muscle cell. Now I want to show you 
what they really look like, not drawn by anybody, but a histological section of a motor neuron. And that's this thing here. And I probably shouldn't use a red laser pointer, but you can see where I'm at here. Here's an axon coming. It splits down. So here the axon is talking to this muscle cell. This one is talking to this muscle cell and so forth and so on. But it's a beautiful histological section of a real motor end plate. Now this one, this nice diagram that somebody drew, brings up the point of a motor unit. A motor unit is one axon coming down, one main axon. It splits off to different muscle fibers. And then whenever this is carrying an action potential, it's, in this diagram, going to cause five muscle fibers to contract. And that's a motor unit. If it was like one large axon here and only one fiber, you have very fine control. If you have five, you have less control, less finesse. If you had one motor neuron talking to a hundred muscle fibers, then you have very crude movement because every little action potential comes down here that would talk to a lot of muscle. Then down in the lower part, we have two motor units and they're, col they're color coded. This motor unit is talking to three muscle fibers, whereas this top one, the original, I guess, no, it's not the original, it's got four. One, two, three, four. Okay, so that's the concept of a motor unit. The axon talks to how many muscle cells. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about neuromuscular disorders, diseases, just to give you a little flavor of what can happen. Since you know the normal functioning now of the neuromuscular junction, um, I want to tell you about some abnormal things. Let's do neurotoxins. Some neurotoxins affect the neuromuscular junction. For example, tetanus toxin, which is one of the most toxic toxins in the world, I understand. Anyway, it prevents acetylcholine release at the neuromuscular junction. Also under neurotoxins, we could talk about snake venom, which sometimes different venoms prevent the release of acetylcholine from the presynaptic membrane. Others actually bind to the specific acetylcholine receptor on the postsynaptic membrane and prevents muscle contraction in that manner. Also, there's a whole slew of autoimmune disorders or diseases. Autoimmune means it's coming from the animal or person itself, autoimmunity, where the immune system is battling part of the body, which is not ever a good case. Here's one example. Um, myasthenia gravis, often having the MG acronym. This is a case where there are antibodies that bind to the receptor and actually sometimes damage or at least prevent the acetylcholine from binding to the receptor, but oftentimes destroys the receptor.